Well, I want to welcome everybody to the first of our panels, the, uh, which is entitled uh, Managing the Perimeter, Joint Law Enforcement and Detecting Threats Early. Ambassador Jacobson, in his address to us, uh, outlining Beyond the Border, uh, gave us a good context in which to pursue this uh, uh, first panel. It's an interesting, um, a and as we heard, the, the issue really isn't about shared goals. Canada and the United States uh, share the goals. We both respect the rule of law. Uh, we both are concerned about stopping terrorist threats, about dealing <laughs> with organized crime, about pre we're preventing the flow of uh, uh, drugs, of dealing with smugglers, of tracking counterfeit goods, dealing with cross-border cyber fraud, all of these things. And so that the issue isn't whether we disagree on goals or not, I don't think. The problems are in cross-border arrangements of the sort we're ta talking about is we have different constitutions, we have different political institutions, we have <laughs> different laws, we have uh, uh, different cultures. In Canada, nobody worries about a single universal pay health care system. If you watch the debates uh, for the GOP nomination, this is a huge issue. We have different experiences, and you see that again on immigration. For the United States, a huge immigration issue is illegal immigration. It's not really a big issue in Canada. It is sometimes an issue, but that affects public attitudes towards immigration. And if you look at the Pew surveys between our two countries, the support for immigration is overwhelmingly positive in Canada and much more divided in the United States. So that's something else we have to deal with. We have different ways of, we're both concerned in, in our countries about privacy issues, um, but we have different ways of dealing with privacy. And all of these kinds of things um, make it a challenge for political leaders and officials and agencies to, to deal with our shared goals. Now, we're very fortunate today because we've got three speakers who can speak at different levels of this issue. Anne McClellan, Canada's first Minister of Public Safety and Energy Prepar uh, Emergency Preparedness, served as Minister, also served as Minister of Health, Justice, and Attorney General for Canada, and Minister of Natural Resources, which included the energy field. She can talk about how we deal with these issues at the political level. In her capacity as a minister, she dealt with both Tom Ridge and Michael Cherkov. And so this is where the grand designs emerge from, these meetings. <laughs> Heather Brown, uh, after a long, uh, has had a long public service career. And uh, she served, as Ambassador Jacobson mentioned, play, played a key role at uh, the DHS attache at the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa in the discussions on Beyond the Border. But be, prior to that, she had experience uh, on the Canada desk, if you like, at DHS, and on the immigration file. So uh, she will be able to talk about what happens after the grand uh, uh, proclamations are issued at the political level, at the official level, you actually have to put teeth on these things. And there you get into <coughs> the awful detail and nitty gritty of how all these agencies and officials are actually going to agree and find common purpose. And so uh, she can talk to us on that issue. And thirdly, we have, uh, uh, and both, I should say, both Anne McClellan and Heather Brown are now in the private sector. Uh, so I'm hoping, I think we all hope, that they can be uh, a little more candid, if that's the right word, about their experience in uh, developing these policies. And our third speaker is Captain uh, uh, Sugimoto, who uh, operates, he has to make, enforce the things that people actually agree, design and agree on. And he has a huge responsibility uh, as Chief of Incident Management for the 9th Coast Guard District, which, for those of you who don't know, includes all of the Great Lakes, the St. Lawrence Seaway, and parts of surrounding states. So it's a huge uh, 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 part of the geography of, uh, of our two countries. And he can talk, as I say, about uh, 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 implementation and how, how these agreements are actually enforced at the uh, uh, at the operational level. So I'd like to, I've asked each speaker to speak for about 12 minutes, 
And I'll start by asking Anne McClellan if she would lead off and then be followed by Teresa Brown and then by uh, Captain Sugimoto. So, Anne. Thank you very much. And anyone who knows me in the room, like my former colleague Jim Peterson at the back, knows that it's hard for me to say my name in less than three minutes. So I've got 12. So I'm uh, going to go very quickly here. It's, it's kind of short snappers in terms of my experience as a minister in the government of Canada from 93 to January 06 um, and uh, the involvement that I had uh, with many uh, outstanding American counterparts in uh, figuring out, especially after 9-11, how we dealt with our shared challenge of uh, ensuring uh, the collective security um, of our two countries and uh, while respecting the individual rights and liberties of those who lived in uh, and live in our two countries. First of all, let me say by way of context that I actually don't see, and I'm not sure Chris Sands agrees with me here or not, but I actually don't see the Beyond the Border Action Plan as a, any particular break with the past. I actually see this as evolutionary, as I think you would expect between two countries who have lived next door to each other for a very long time and who do in fact have uh, shared values and shared concerns to a to a large degree so um, clearly if you look at um, and Eric Miller and I were talking about this last night really if you look at uh, from the time of the free trade agreement at least you started to see a ramping up of I think shared and ultimately integrated law enforcement which is what this panel is about um, and after 9-11 the necessity and uh, pressures for uh, further enhancements around uh, cooperation, collaboration, and ultimately integration as it relates to law enforcement became um, obviously uh, so much more evident. So I start from a point where beyond the border is evolutionary. It's not a break with the past. Now, there are some things in that document that we, as a liberal government of Canada, found hard to discuss honestly and openly. We were, in fact, told that as part of official government policy, the P word, that would be perimeter, that in fact the P word was not one that we should throw around very often uh, and injudiciously, because that, of course, raises all sorts of concerns in the minds of uh, a significant number of Canadians. But don't for a minute think that we were not working on the perimeter. What we called it was pushing the border out. And somehow that seemed a lot more acceptable, both within our government, within our own caucus, and with the rest of the country. So when you look at beyond the border, the action plan as it relates to cross-border law enforcement. What are the things that are discussed there? Well, it's Shiprider, which we're going to hear a lot more about, uh, which was in, in, in essence um, a, a desire to push the border out. IBETS, again, uh, integrated uh, border enforcement teams. Um, a, a desire to reconfigure the border, in some cases push that border out, um, and uh, th those, those were initiatives that uh, were, I think, hallmarks of uh, the work that I did and others in our government did with our American counterparts. Also, keep in mind, yes, the world changed on 9-11, but these two countries had long been working on shared law enforcement. Borders weren't new to us on 9-11. And in fact, we were dealing with organized crime across our borders and in our waters for a significant period of time. I will say that 9-11, I think, put a renewed focus on the nature of the border, the nature of the sharing that had to take place, and the resources and the new ways we need to do business, including such an enormous emphasis on uh, information gathering, information analysis, what we now all wrap up in intelligence-led operations. And again, the Beyond the Border Action Plan, the basis in this area of shared law enforcement is actually intelligence-led operations. And um, as we all know, um, I think, and, and this became clear to everyone after 9-11, although not a new revelation to those on the front lines, after 9-11, uh, described as an information failure, 
it simply became unacceptable for us in our two countries not to figure out the kinds of information we needed to collect, the way we needed to analyze it, and the key, get it back in real time to you uh, and all your people so you can actually interdict those, be they a terrorist or uh, a member of an organized criminal organization operating for profit. But, um, uh, so that, as I say, Beyond the Border to me builds on a lot of history that these two countries have had. That's not surprising. Um, now, um, very, very quickly, let me say, um, it's interesting that in the Beyond the Border plan, the, 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 there's, the, the smallest part of this plan actually deals with, cro with cross-border law enforcement. You know, we get a page, I think, in the action plan. Um, and maybe that is because one is building on a, a history, uh, whether it's, it's between our customs officials, agencies, whether it's between the RCMP and the Coast Guard, as you will hear with Shiprider. But I, I also think that this is an absolutely key area moving forward. And it not only, yes, it deals with challenges around terrorism and national security, but this also speaks to what I call traditional criminal law enforcement. And if you look at uh, the integrated border enforcement teams, of which we now have 15 and 24 geographic locations between our two countries, they tell you over and over again, their big challenge is not terrorism. They're not discounting it, but their big challenge isn't terrorism. It's the bread and butter of criminal law enforcement. It is counterfeiting. It is human smuggling. Uh, it is uh, contraband uh, goods, including uh, tobacco. It is firearms. And that has, as I say, been the bread and butter of our integrated border enforcement teams, and it will continue to be the bread and butter. Uh, IBETs have been a huge success, although difficult to organize in many respects because they're multi-agency, contrasted with Shiprider, where in fact Shiprider's become a bit of the poster child for integrated law enforcement. And it's interesting because there uh, you do not have the complexity that you have with IBETs, where we have at least five agencies, Canadian, U.S., and likely to have more. Shiprider, two agencies, the Coast Guard and the RCMP, as we discussed last night, two agencies that respect each other, understand how they do business. And that, in part, is the reason Shiprider, if you look at Beyond the Border, has become the poster child for integrated law enforcement. And in fact, now what people want to do is take Shiprider and put it on land, and that's next generation. Now, the key to Shiprider is cross-designation, and don't for a minute think that this is not a, or was, a difficult issue. When Tom Ridge and I, sitting in Detroit, on the Detroit side, looking across to the Windsor side with the Detroit River and the St. Clair River, um, <coughs> we, uh, that was the first meeting in which Shiprider, as far as I know, was actually put on the table. And Tom Ridge and I thought, what a great idea. In fact, 43% of our shared border is water. And therefore, what a great idea if we actually took up this vulnerability, because we'd identified it as a big <clears throat> vulnerability in terms of our shared security. Why don't we take this up and figure out a new way to work together, to truly integrate, to go beyond cooperation, go beyond collaboration to integration? What did we have to do? Because Ships go, if it's a U.S. Coast Guard ship or an RCMP vessel, back and forth across that largely unmarked border. We figured out, thanks to all the people who were working, uh, lawyers and others, in our, in our respective governments, that if we could cross-designate these people, then in fact, you would solve a big chunk of the problem. So on a U.S. Coast Guard vessel, you have U.S. Coast Guard officers, you have cross-designated uh, RCMP officers and vice versa when Coast Guard is on a, an RCMP vessel. We are not enforcing each other's laws. We're enforcing our own laws, which is an important political point for everyone to remember. So when I talked about Shiprider, I was not suggesting that an American U.S. Coast Guard officer would be enforcing Canadian law or his law on the Canadian side of the border. There would, be a there would be an RCMP officer on that ship if an incident happened in Canadian waters. It would be the RCMP officer dealing with the matter, and Canadian law would be applied. 
just as if an incident happened on the U.S. side of the border. I think I've got that right. And that solved an enormous host of legal and political problems for us. Now, I'm not suggesting that at this point uh, there are not other issues uh, that we still need to work on with Shiprider, but I wanted to talk a little bit about that at the political level because it is the poster child for integrated law enforcement between our two countries. Shiprider actually grew out of the IBETS. It was a marine IBETS uh, initiative. Again, integrated border enforcement teams. Keep in mind, this IBETS were not motivated by 9-11. IBETS started in the mid-90s. And um, I, Shiprider grew out of that and was, in fact, inspired uh, by the incident, uh, the events of 9-11 and what we needed uh, to do there. But IBETS, again, a very successful initiative around what I call traditional law enforcement, recognizing we share borders, we have common concerns, and criminals, especially organized criminals, organized crime, go back and forth on a regular basis and are a huge problem, both in terms of our civil society uh, and uh, uh, other, other aspects of, of uh, life between our two countries. Let me just say a few things very quickly. Stop. One minute. Okay, let me just say, uh, integrated, we have moved from cooperation to collaboration to integration. I don't think it's surprising. I think it is the right way to go. Uh, we've been at work on a number of these initiatives. They predated 9-11. Um, I think we, I found it encouraging to see in the document a specific reference to risk management. Speaking as a Canadian in government after 9-11, even though we all talked, our Canadian and American counterparts, uh, all together about risk management, we on the Canadian side actually knew day in, day out, zero risk was the only thing that mattered to Americans. That no risk after 9-11 in the years following, and perhaps even today, but I think perhaps uh, we're at that why you see in the document the reference to risk management and risk uh, identification and mitigation. That, that was the language we used after 9-11, but we knew no risk was allowed. No risk would be tolerated. And that drove a lot of what we did at the time and the pressure cooker in which we lived. So I'm so encouraged as it relates to integrated law enforcement to see the concept of risk management front and center in this document. And let's hope that that, in fact, is operationalized in ways that make sense for all of us. Um, one uh, last uh, thing I would say, um, I actually think at this point, when you talk about integrated law enforcement, if you separate that and you talk about organized crime and you talk about uh, a criminal activity uh, in and around the borders, if you put it in those terms, Canadians feel, interestingly, a lot more comfortable with that than if you tell them, we're doing this because of the terrorist threat. Now, it maybe is the opposite in the US, but in Canada, people believed rightly or wrongly, that there was an over-preoccupation that continues to today with our American neighbors around terrorism and national security issues and what that might do to one's civil rights and uh, uh, civil liberties and human rights. So I actually think cross-border law enforcement as understood traditionally in dealing with traditional criminal activities is a much easier sell in Canada than if you premise these activities on the fact that we are protecting Canadians and our American neighbors from the scourge of terrorism. And uh, uh, there are a whole bunch of reasons for that, that we live day in, day out uh, in the decade after 9-11. And we can talk about that more if you want. So I'm going to uh, stop uh, there, David, uh, but to say that everything I see in this document as it relates to integrated law enforcement builds on the past. It is absolutely the right direction in which to be going. Yes, there are implementation and operational challenges, but I am convinced, based on our history together, that we're going to be able to overcome most of them. Yeah. And that's a terrific start uh, to our panel, and uh, maybe the uh, uh, Ambassador Dewar and Jacobson will get you out to sell the agreement now. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Prime Minister Harper would love a former <laughs> liberal selling his agreement. <laughs>
Well, Robert Stanfield solved the official language. <laughs> That's act. true, he did. Uh, not Pierre Trudeau. Um, Teresa, let's hear from you now. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. Um, I, I want to thank Ambassador Jacobson because I, I think it's not often that us nameless, faceless bureaucrats actually get named um, <laughs> as being part and parcel of these big, huge leader agreements. But I, I really appreciate that call out. Um, and I'm fortunate to have not only Ambassador Jacobson, but another former boss of mine, uh, Paul Rosenzweig, uh, uh, here as well. Um, I, I served as a nameless, faceless bureaucrat uh, under both Secretary Chertoff and Secretary Napolitano, both in Washington, D.C. and in Ottawa. And I just want to explain a little bit how the role of policymakers and bureaucrats in these initiatives. Um, I think uh, we tend to get a bad rap sometimes, um, but I think that, that we have an important role to play. And it, I always saw my role in sort of two, two aspects. First is, my job was to implement the directions of the political leaders I served. Uh, the political leadership comes in, and they are always desirous of achieving results. Political leaders have a time in which they know they're going to serve, and they know that that's going to end, and so they always have an agenda of things they want to accomplish. And so they want to move on those things, and that was my job to try to help implement that. Um, and, the, and that presented its own challenges because, of course, governmental institutions, by their very nature, move slower <laughs> than people always want them to. And also, the leadership that comes in doesn't necessarily always understand the complexities of what they're talking about. That's why they have people like us who are subject matter experts to help understand the details. But the second role, and I think equally important, was, in, as I saw it, protecting the operators, the people who actually had to go out there every day and do this stuff. Protect them from what? Well, protect them by having clear and consistent policy and guidance, making sure they had legal authorities for everything that they were doing, um, and making sure that they were protected from uh, unwarranted liability and have proper oversight over what they're doing so that the activities that they are undertaking are fully covered in law, in policy, in regulation, and they can get the job done without having to worry about all that stuff. Um, so that's how I saw my, my two-parted role. Um, and I think, you know, from the operator's perspective, they, they tend to want to just get the job done. We're, we're out here every day. We see what needs to go happen. Why can't we just go do it? Leave us alone, you big bad people from Washington or Ottawa, and let us just go do our jobs. Um, and that's great until something happens. And frequently, I think people in the front line don't always understand that their daily operations can have policy implications, can have political op implications if something doesn't happen according to plan. Um, so that was, that was sort of my two-pronged role um, in government. I think, um, as, as, as Anne McClellan said, I agree also that Beyond the Border is, is an evolution of what had come before. Um, I think it's a significant evolution, and I can talk a little bit why, why that. But I think, um, Ambassador, a little bit my role in bringing it about, as someone who had served uh, under Secretary Chertoff, under Secretary Napolitano, has been a, uh, involved for a number of years prior to even service in government in U.S.-Canada relations, I, I looked at the relationship between the United States and Canada after 9-11 and, and tried to understand sort of what, what were the lessons learned from what had gone before? What were the lessons that we learned from trying to implement uh, the Ridge Manley Accords, what, what Anne had worked on? What were the lessons we learned under the Security and Prosperity Partnership? And how could we learn those lessons properly to put together a, a renewed framework that would actually achieve results? Um, and so I think some of the things, again, from the bureaucratic perspective, from the policy level perspective that I learned and tried to, to get my leadership to adopt, um, was that the first lesson is we really needed to have alignment on the goals and the things that we were trying to accomplish. I think early after 9-11, um, we, we had, even though we had agreements, we had different priorities. Um, Canada was very, very focused on making sure the border stayed open for trade, for travel and prosperity. And as Anne said, the United States was very absorbed with security. We still f felt that a, a new attack of 9-11 of proportions could happen at any minute. And, and we, we tended, I think, to approach it, even though we're trying to get the same things done, we had different levels of priorities in trying to get those things done. And when we, we, we sort of couched that difference in broad language, that when it came down to us to, to implement and interpret, the policy makers, the people on either side of the table, found those differences pretty early. So I thought that the first thing we had to do is make sure that we were absolutely clear with each other from the get-go, perfectly blunt and honest, about what our goals and priorities were. 
um, and deal with that up front rather than couching it in, in some, some language that met a political need but didn't help us who had to do it get it done. Um, one of the things you'll see in Beyond the Border, the risk management piece of it, starts with joint threat assessments. How can we attack a problem if we don't come at it from the same understanding? So, so let's, let's do that together. Let's, let's merge our threat assessments and let's see if we have alignment on our understanding of the threats and then we can have alignment on what to do about them. But it starts by having understanding of the alignment of the threats. So it starts with, as a question my, my current boss says to me all the time, what problem are we trying to solve? Do we both agree on the problem we're trying to solve and then we can move forward on that? The second lesson that I think came out of those is, is we really need to be specific about the actions we want to take. Um, again, this gets to vague statements of intent that meet a political need are really insufficient for people like me to implement. Um, because then, it, then you put the burden on us to figure out what you meant. And again, if the, if the, if the goals are not aligned on either side, uh, the people who have to implement it are going to look at that and have different interpretations of what their leaders meant. And then you have made that problem just a level down and it still isn't solved. So to the extent we can be really specific about the actions we're going to take. And if you look at this action plan, it is very specific. Um, it is more detailed than we have seen in previous documents about exactly what measures, what steps are going to be taken, timelines for doing so. That's an accountability piece. That's the next one. Um, to, uh, to achieve the goals that were laid out in the declaration from February. Um, the third thing is put the right people in charge. And by that, I don't necessarily mean people like me. But when you have agreements that touch on multiple parts of the government, then it is absolutely necessary that you put in charge of implementing and overseeing all of that people who actually have uh, authority to address every part of your government. Um, one of the issues we had in SPP was that the security pillar was put in, the Home Secretary Chertoff was put in charge of the security pillar, but there were awful lots of that security pillar that were not DHS owned. Uh, DOT owned pieces, DOE owned pieces, Justice Department owned pieces, and we couldn't make them do things. It was a constant internal negotiation all the time to get things done. Um, and, and similar on the Canadian side. So being able, in this agreement, you look at the, the, the institution of who's running it. It's being run from central authorities. It's being run from the national security staff at the White House in Washington, the bureaucrats in charge of running the government bureaucracy across the bureaucracy. And it's being run out of Ottawa from the Privy Council office. Again, the bureaucrats in charge of corralling all the bureaucrats. That's where you can actually get impetus to get things done. And it also helps because they can continually push uh, the people in the agencies to make progress and be accountable to the leaders. Um, I think the next one is figuring out what the hard issues are going to be and addressing them early. And when I say the hard issues, the issues that really touch on the fundamental differences that we have between the United States and Canada. We have an awful lot of similarities. We have an awful lot of areas where we align very well. But we do have different constitutional frameworks, different cultural backgrounds, different attitudes in many cases toward government. And so we have to figure out where those are going to be problematic to achieve the goals we've laid out and address them early. From people in my point of perspective, we can't make the political choices of what is an acceptable risk for our country. We can recommend things, but that's really up to our political leaders to make those decisions. We have to be not afraid as bureaucrats to put those issues on the table, frame them for our leadership, and get that decision made. Um, frequently, there is a tendency on part of bureaucrats, myself included from time to time, to not want to give the boss the bad news. Right? We don't want to tell them that that great thing that you announced that you really, really want to do, we're having a hard time getting it done. We don't want to say that because then somehow it's a failure on our side. But the answer really is that you need to identify those issues early. What's outside my authority and mandate? What really needs to be dealt with at the political level? And get it to them quickly so that they can hash that out and make those decisions. And we don't have things going on for years and years only to end up in disappointment. Land preclearance. Pre-clearance, um, <laughs> exactly. That's, I wrote down pre-clearance pilots. We, We're we still need, trying to right. get those off the um, ground. So, so I think that you know, it's important from a, 
how do you make up something like this work? And I think that last one is especially important when you're talking about issues of integrated law enforcement. Why? Because there are significant challenges. Um, Shiprider has m m really dealt with a lot of those challenges over a period of five <coughs> or six years. The negotiations went on for a very long time before there was an agreement. And even now, we're still waiting on Canada to pass a legislative package that will formally authorize a lot of the stuff that's been agreed to. So it's not done. <laughs> uh, it's great. It's been piloted a lot. We all think it operationally works, but it's not done yet. Um, there are very tricky issues there. And, and applying that same framework to the land border creates even more complexities. For example, um, when you're talking about water borders, yes, there's an invisible line in the middle of the Great Lake or along the St. Lawrence that's the border. And Shiprider overcomes that by saying when you're in Canadian waters, Canadians in charge, Canadian leads the effort, Canadian authority works. When you're on the US side, US authority, US people in charge, that's what that works. But the waterways themselves end, right? You hit land. And that's the extent of jurisdiction of Shiprider for the most part. If you talk about taking that concept over to the land border, well, how big is the land border area? How far away from the border should those cross designations land, for example? That's a really tough issue to figure out. Um, is, 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 you know, 10 miles, 20 miles, 25 miles, maybe it depends on what part of the border you're at as to how much big a border area you need. Those are some of the challenging issues from a legal perspective, from a sovereignty perspective, that, that have to be dealt with to make something like this work. Um, how do you trans actually transition that authority? It's all fine and easy to say that when you're in Canadian waters, the Canadians are in charge, U.S. waters, the U.S. is in charge. How do you actually transition that authority to make that happen when you're actually out there doing it. That, that's something that the operators absolutely need to know, and they have to have a framework and policy in which to figure it out. And then there are a whole bunch of other laws that you don't think about that actually have to be dealt with. Customs laws. Our customs laws don't allow people to just bring firearms into the other country, even law enforcement officers. <laughs> so we have to figure out a way to deal with the customs laws to permit those cross-designated law enforcement officers to actually carry their equipment into the other country and not violate a customs law. Or, for example, an immigration law. They're doing work. <laughs> you know, it's, it sounds silly, you know, that that would be, but somebody has to deal with that because they are laws. You can't just ignore them or, or waive them. Somebody has to do with that, deal with that and make sure that all of those contingencies are, are covered so that at the end of the day, the operators can do what they have to do to get the job done. Um, so I, I think, you know, just to wrap it up, um, it's, it's wonderful. I think we've got a really good framework in place under Beyond the Border. I think we've really tried hard to learn the lessons. What's going to make it work or not is the consistent um, oversight by those central bodies, um, the, the goodwill of all of the people like me who are still in government hashing all this stuff out on a daily basis. And believe me, they have really good relationships. Um, and, that, and, and keeping that political will and political space in place to keep it on track. Thank you. Teresa, thanks a lot. You guys are following the script perfectly. <laughs> and now we're going to hear from Captain Sugimoto about whether it's all working. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. And first, I want to say it's a privilege to be here with my uh, fellow panel members uh, and the distinguished audience. Um, why is a Coast Guard officer sitting in front of you, and why is it not perhaps the uh, CBP or any number of other federal agencies from the United States that um, protect our borders? And first off, um, because between the Canada and the United States, just in the Great Lakes alone, there's 1,500 miles of shared maritime border, which is the equivalent of taking a drive from Brownsville, Texas to San Diego, California. That's the distance we're talking about. It is also an enormous amount of trade that goes back and forth in this particular region, and it is our infrastructure, our people, somewhere in the neighborhood of 300,000, and about 1.5 billion that crosses the border every single day. A vessel that enters the St. Lawrence Seaway to bring cargo in or take wheat transport or, or uh, raw metals out has to cross, if they travel all five Great Lakes, crosses the U.S. and Canadian border sometime around 17 different times depending on where their ports are. They have a capability of doing that. So once again, 
we need to look at that 1,500 miles of shared maritime border. So what are some of the successes here? And first of all, I think I should say it's an honor to be called an operator because I drive a big brown desk right now. <laughs> so, um, Motorized? so uh, what are some of the successes that we have and, and the things that we've seen that, that uh, show that we are indeed living with the spirit of beyond the border and as you said is merely sort of an evolution further in the step and, and carried further uh, with the good work of uh, people like Teresa Brown. Uh, number one is the 96 hour notice. All merchant vessels coming into the country have to now give us 96 hour notice prior to arrival. They can't just show up at the doorstep and say hey, I have cargo for you. That allows us jointly to verify and look at the cargo to ensure that the crew manifests have been uh, examined and then they are allowed to proceed and uh, given a secondary inspection on a whole host of other different things. Um, but first and foremost, uh, we want to make sure we protect the environment just as much as perhaps from criminal or terrorist activities. So one of the major successes has been the ballast water inspections and this is a joint verification between the two nations which went into place in 2006 and since that verification went into place in 2006, according to recent studies from both countries, no new invasive species have been brought in by ballast water to the Great Lakes. What's another success? As uh, my esteemed colleagues here pointed out, Shiprider is, uh, for us, is a great success. The simplicity and the respect uh, that goes into this particular operation whereby Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers ride on Coast Guard vessels and we ride on Canadian vessels allows us to jointly enforce uh, laws, respect each other's sovereignty, civil liberties, and yet maintain the security and the necessary law enforcement to protect the civilian population on both sides of the country. We've employed this in the Vancouver Olympic Games the G20 summit, and we hope to look forward to future operations this particular summer as well. We have done more than just also in the vein of Shiprider of merely coming up with temporary operations. We've established training programs whereby Royal Canadian Mounted Police Officers and U.S. Coast Guard boarding officers train together at the Law Enforcement Academy in Charleston, South Carolina and they review each other's laws and then they get certified in order to be one of these shiprider officers. Another tangent point or another point that is brought up in the Beyond the Border is the drive to reduce regulation that overlaps or there creates gaps or something else which prevents trade, sort of one of the central themes here and it's one of our jobs as a law enforcement and a regulator on the water to enforce those regulations. So we, along with Transport Canada and Transport Sa Canada Safety and Security, excuse me, have been examining those regulations, the, the MITSA and MITSA regulations, the Maritime Transportation Safety Act and the Mat Maritime Transportation uh, Safety Regulation together. And uh, my colleagues, uh, led by Commander Paul Markland up there, have uh, uh, examined the gaps, the overlays, and uh, the redundancies in those re regulations and to find what can be reduced in the spirit of pursuing beyond border agreement. And it looks like that we will be able to give that analysis to the Joint Regulatory Council that which was formed on this sometime by the end of April, beginning of May and for further action along those grounds too. Intelligence sharing, as we had talked about and one of the principal th means for us to both combat uh, organized crime and or possible terrorist um, attacks on the United States or operations is the sharing of intelligence. And as both of us have very strong civil liberties when it comes to the freedom of our personal information of other things like that, it has been somewhat of a challenge but we have moved forward. In the Maritime Security Operations Centers, MSOC, of which there's one on the West Coast, in uh, near Victoria, I believe, one in uh, St. Catharines, right across the river from Buffalo uh, in the Midwest here, and then one in Halifax. We have individuals that jointly share information, particularly as an example is those crew, crew, crew lists that I was talking about, are the vessels that give 96-hour notice coming into the United States. 
and we share and make sure that we have that information passed to both countries. As I said, that vessel could travel 17 times between both in both countries' waters before making a port call. Vitally important. Are there other places that give us hope or show that we can overcome uh, those minute differences, yet very important differences in the past? Yes, we have NORAD. It's one of the principal things that started in 1940. Um, we have the search and rescue um, memorandums of agreements between the two countries, whereby we work jointly on an almost daily basis to rescue people out of the water. Environmental and emergency response, we have individuals capable of traveling, not stopping at the border, border, through the border basically to respond to emergency incidents on both sides of the border to help each other out. And then finally, one of the end state successes that we are looking for is something very similar to um, what we have now in Montreal, which is the Joint Initial Verification Team. And uh, we, we call it Jivit 2.0, for lack of a better name right now, but this Jivit 2.0 is the conceptual binational Montreal field office that would become the gatekeeper for the Great Lakes system. Effectively, we would push both countries further, the borders further out. We conduct joint compliance inspection for both ballast water, international safety regulations, as well as cargo inspections, and provide a single inspection point for all things safety, security, environmental. This would also include members from the U.S. Coast Guard, Transport Canada, Safety and Security, St. Lawrence Seaway Development and Management Corporation, and then as we expand and are able to come overcome some of those differences that Teresa is working on, would grow to include CBP, CBSA, and DND. From a point of view that I should say, first and foremost, on the deck plate level, we have nothing but the highest respect for our colleagues on the shared border yes. with Canada. And we work very well with them. We have some of the tightest relationships along those borders. But there are some things that we can improve on. Information law is an area that we need to work on between the two countries. The ability to pass that information back and forth. There are some inefficiencies in it. It's not saying it's wrong because our civil liber liber liberties and the Constitution in each country have, have basically developed along those particular lines. But in order to become more efficient, in order to take this to the next level, these are some of the things that we work on. And I say this to the students because there's plenty of work for you here. <laughs> identity cards. Currently, there is a Mariner identity card for Canada, and we have the TWIC card. Um, if there was one recognized card between the two nations, it would reduce wait times, it would reduce overhead, it would reduce regulatory redundancies. Um, and would go a long way to enhancing the beyond the border perimeter security model. Also perhaps recognizing multimodal pre-screening programs. Taking it one step further, this card or this individual had been pre-screened previously. Should it make a difference then whether that individual is going by car, by rail, or by boat, but perhaps there should be a multimodal modal program. And then perhaps most importantly is giving commerce the predictability it needs to become a viable option in the markets without sacrificing security, as predictability is also the Achilles heel of security. And by doing those types of things and overcoming that things, which is a lot of work here, I think that I've laid out for Teresa, unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> um, and uh, it is something that I think, as Anne very, very astutely pointed out, is definitely something within reach. This is something merely that we are evolving towards and moving forward. So as you saw from the top, where the political will was there, from the bureaucrats in the middle, and then finally the operators on the ground, we want this to happen. We encourage it to happen. We think it's a great idea. And um, we look forward to seeing how it develops. Thank you. Andrew, thank you very much. I think that uh, we went through the three stages of political, you called it bureaucratic, operational, but you make the important point at the end that the operational is going to feed back into the political. Absolutely. Well, you start the process all over again. Um, we have uh, uh, almost half an hour for questions because the speakers have been well disciplined in the amount of time <laughs> they took. And so I'd like to invite people now uh, to bring up their questions. Uh, the organizers would like everybody who wants to ask a question to come to the mic. There's a reason for that, it's a recording <coughs> thing. And so 
the two mics are open, and um, let's uh, hear some, get some good questions. So we've had good presentations, and they raise a lot of issues. So now it's your turn. Yeah. Uh, yes, is done. Uh, Dana Hicks, Hoover Technology. I'm also honorary Canadian consul in Charlotte, North Carolina. You referred to three locations that are sharing information. It strikes me as that's not enough. Um, my question in, uh, to the panel is, where else other than Victoria, uh, St. Catharines, and Halifax is information being shared? And can you elaborate on some of the other organizations? Is the FBI, for example, sharing information mm -hmm. with you? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, I, if, I apologize if that was misunderstood. That was specifically talking about screening and us working with uh, Canada, uh, looking at the vessel, um, vessels that are coming in or where we share information and we look at this as a particular success. But as, as Anne pointed out, IBETS is, is a major um, place where we share information as well as each of the agencies have their counterparts where um, they talk to each other on a daily basis and they have probably a much closer relationship in some cases than they do with their bosses back in Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, it, it, that's just the, the, the great part about working with the Canadians. As I mentioned, information sharing was one of the things after 9-11 that we understood that we needed to do a lot better on, and certainly on the Canadian side, and I guess our American neighbors would say the same thing. So, but sharing of information, every significant Canadian agency today shares information. Keep in mind, in our own government, we had a challenge after 9-11 to get across departments agencies and departments sharing information domestically. So we created the uh, ITAC, Integrated Threat Assessment Center. That was domestic, but then of course the information that came out of there, as well as agency collected information, where appropriate, based on our protocols, was then shared with whichever agency or department in the U.S. would have been relevant in relation to that information. But uh, I think generally a pretty good flow of information, CISA, CIA, FBI, RCMP, customs agencies, Coast Guard, um, information, and you were talking about this earlier, we have hundreds of protocols around the sharing of information, and uh, we're getting better at it. We're not perfect. And for it to be useful, as I said, it's got to be in real time. Yeah. But we're getting a lot better. Yeah, I, I just to elaborate on that. We we once tried um, to to actually do a catalog of all of the information sharing agreements just our DHS entities had with their counterparts, and it was hundreds, plural, um, from legacy agencies to uh, uh, recent agreements. Um, with the challenge of managing hundreds of different information sharing agreements, of course, is is they were done for specific purposes in sort of one-to-one -one relationships. And again, after 9-11, what we found is the value of figuring out who else has relevant pieces of information right. and being able to share across. And in the U.S. government, we are trying to do a lot of that under something we call the information sharing environment, which is the federal level information sharing framework and structure um, that's all on the web, ISE.gov. ISE um, it's it's tr open and transparent because of the privacy issues involved, right, um, of how we share that information again. And with our Canadian partners, Ann mentioned that the, the law enforcement piece beyond the border is one page, but it is completely dependent on everything yeah. that's in the addressing threats yeah. early section, yeah, by absolutely. the way. Um, yeah. We could not do a lot of those law enforcement things without the, uh, the, th the joint threat assessments, the, the information sharing agreements that we're trying to put that together, because that's how you make your risk decisions. That's how you drive intelligence-led law enforcement, is by getting that information, evaluating it, and vetting it. So. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I, I want to underscore what Ann McClellan said, though. I, I was amazed when I was serving in, in government, particularly as uh, Governor of Michigan, how close the Michigan State Police were in terms of cooperation with the Ontario Provincial Police, how well they were integrated. And of course, the same was true in Ottawa when I learned that all of our agencies in law enforcement and intelligence, as well as military, uh, have an incredibly integrated set of relationships. I found often, though, that while, they're, while the U.S. and Canadian counterparts got along really well, they didn't always get along well with their, with their sister agencies in their own country. It was really interesting. 
but but I but you guys have done a fabulous job here this morning of highlighting the reality of, of the beyond the border. I have a question for Teresa though. You know, the Department of Energy was created many years ago. It still is somewhat dysfunctional in the United States. <laughs> the Department of Transportation is also relatively new in our cabinet. It is still somewhat dysfunctional. And now, of course, at the prodding of some Democrats, President Bush created the Department of Homeland Security, which is bits and pieces of 27 different agencies and departments and 170,000 people. Teresa, is this thing working or beginning to work? I mean, this, this is a kind of bureaucracy that could make even the most ardent 1950s Chinese communists blush here. I, I don't know what how it says. How is it going? I, Ter I, Teresa, well, how's it going? I don't know what it says that I'm no longer working for them. Um, no, I, I think that. Now you can give us the truth. Yeah. <laughs> um, DHS, as you know, the, the youngest uh, of, of those, those cabinet departments, um, is still growing. It's still, you know, I don't think we're even quite, I would say we're quite a teenagerhood in some of those areas. Um, but it's made a lot of progress. And, and the challenge, I think, you know, Secretary Ridge used this analogy, Secretary Chertoff has used it, every, every Secretary of Homeland Security has said, you know, we're, we're building the airplane as it's flying kind of thing, right? We formed after 9-11 with an immediate mandate to secure the homeland, whatever that meant. Homeland wasn't even defined. Um, you know, s secure the homeland immediately every potential vulnerability Congress could spot. There's a hole, go plug it. There's a hole, go plug it. There's a hole, go plug it. There's a hole, go plug it, while building in a, a department and agency. And I think we're at the point now where we have the major mission sets under control. Um, we know, the department knows what it's doing operationally. It has its major mission sets in place. It has the, the framework of how it does things now. It's about maturing that, creating efficiencies, putting an appropriate uh, organizational uh, accountability structure in place at the department level, that, that, that top level that really makes it all work as one unit. Um, that sort of managerial level that's the boring part of government um, is, is now where a lot of that focus is. Um, but you know, that the challenge is doing that in an era of tightening budgets. Um, because no member of Congress, uh, for political reasons, is going to say we're going to cut back on frontline operations to put another person behind the desk at headquarters, right? It, it, no, that's, that's, you might as well just hang up your political shield at that point. But honestly, that's what's needed in many cases. Um, and so it's enabling the department to make the required uh, uh, justifications for why that management level is necessary, how you create efficiencies across the department needs that. Um, and, and creating uh, good policy to oversee all of that. That's, that's still, I think, an area of challenge for the department. And it will take a while. You know, it, it's, it is a very big thing to get your arms around. Yeah. John, did you mind? <coughs> the only other thing I would add is that in addition to the mission of securing, every one of them still had their legacy missions yes. that they had to continue to operate. And, and a not committee that them. told them to not forget it. <laughs> 88 committees and subcommittees in Congress, though. So. Yeah. My question and observation possibly goes beyond uh, the focus of this panel, but I think it's founded to some degree in it. In Beyond the Border, uh, it might be argued that in fact, in terms of people, the border is being even more formally defined and the processes associated with it uh, more uh, purposefully put in, particularly the idea of exit entry controls. Um, the way coordination has come at that border on law enforcement is highly commendable. The border is a very special place in terms of law enforcement because law enforcement has incredibly more liberty in terms of how it goes about its job at the border. Um, I'm wondering if as we're going forward and really <coughs> underscoring that there is that border for people to cross and gathering very fulsome information on them, on everyone through the entry exit. Are we risking a situation where that border is going to become more difficult to cross for business and other purposes, particularly as the focus of the people who are involved in that process on the border are first and foremost, law enforcement people uh, and coming at it from a law enforcement mentality. So 
uh, the Canadian or U.S. business person uh, crossing the border for legitimate NAFTA-covered business reasons, going to make a sales call, mm -hmm. uh, other things. Uh, may will, will we see even more bureaucratic requirements in terms of paperwork to justify <coughs> that that uh, Canada US Law Institute conference you're going to in Cleveland, uh, <laughs> you're not getting paid as a speaker to go there. You are going, you have an invitation or a receipt for it. <laughs> Is there a risk that uh, on people movement, we have uh, the possibility of moving in the wrong direction <coughs> in terms of the broad objectives? I think so, and but I think that's what we're trying to do to get right, is the security portion of it, if done right, I think, Enhance, can enhance trade. It actually can do the opposite. It, as I said before, if there's a predictability about it, what is going to be required or what's needed for that, that, uh, that border crossing, and that is known ahead, whether you're uh, a large company or a small company or you're just an individual going across to the Canada US Law Institute conference, the ability to know what you're going to do and what is needed when you cross that border. Um, I think helps. And at the same point, we still have the competing principle of the security issue. And as Ambassador Jacobson pointed out very astutely, I thought, uh, we haven't given up our sovereignties. And, and it's sort of built into us for the last 200 plus years that we are uh, free nations with free speech and, and sovereignty and our ability here is extremely important to us and an integral part of our identity. And so, I don't think that part is going to go away. We still need to focus on the security, but by adding some predictability and some leveraging technology and information sharing, as was pointed out, that's how we get to the part where, if we do it right, we don't become. If I can just follow up on that real quick. Um, the the entry-exit piece um, actually is something I've been dealing with for long before I actually joined government. Um, folks may remember that in 1996, the U.S. Congress passed a law mandating an entry-exit control system for immigration purposes. It's called Section 110, um, and a lot of my Canadian colleagues will remember that very fondly. <laughs> and, and I at the U.S. Chamber was at the U.S. Chamber at the time and served on a, a congressionally created uh, committee called the Data Management Improvement Act Task Force that was charged with figuring out how in the world the U.S. would do such a thing. And our number one recommendation at how to do that at the land border was have Canada's entry be our exit. Because the only other way to do it at the land border would be to build a complete parallel exit infrastructure, which you want to talk about messing up the border, <laughs> would be disastrous. We still have that mandate on the books. And DHS has been struggling for quite a long time with what in the world do we do with that. And so that was a very important part of this beyond the border agreement, is to say, look, the only way we can do this is with your help. Will you help us, please? Canada, for its own purposes, including some political purposes, said, you know what, we have an interest in knowing when people leave and come to for our own domestic social safety nets. Are they taking <coughs> advantage of us? We have a domestic reason to have this information too, so we both gain from doing that. Um, the key, as you said, is how do you do that without creating additional infrastructure and recordation pieces mm -hmm. at the border? And the answer with that is the technology we've put in place. RFID and what we did under WHTI means that actually more people have <coughs> documents that allow that stuff to be automatically sort of captured so we're not causing additional delays and in many cases speeding up the border process. Um, the other thing I would just say is, is mentioned specifically with regard to business people crossing the border, there is a section in here that talks about how do we do a better job with facilitating business travel under NAFTA. Um, and looking at both the, the types of people who can trust, what kind of documentation, again, pre presenting that, that, that predictability. Can we, can we present documentation once and use it multiple times? How do we, how do, we do that? So they're try really trying to address a lot of those issues, sort of you know, the, the next iteration of that. I'm going to be interested to see how exit entry plays out at the political level. I was part of a government that Section 110 <laughs> was not our friend. No. <laughs> and in fact, we, we were opposed to exit entry controls. We did discuss them at Cabinet. We discussed them at various committees dealing with our uh, security. But I was part of a government that did not see exit entry controls as the way to go. Although as the Minister of Public Safety, who was regularly called out in question period, to answer, do you know how many people of a certain class remain in your country. On any given day, I had at least 30,000 people. I couldn't tell anyone whether they were in the country or not. So from a whole bunch of 
of reasons. And those were people uh, who we had already identified but somehow got lost somewhere. Um, and I'm not suggesting that exit entry necessarily deals with some of those issues. But um, I do believe at this point, and again, this is evolutionary. There's been an evolution. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this piece plays out politically in Canada once it starts to get some attention. I don't think there's been very much attention on this whole exit entry thing and what it might mean. Um, and I think Teresa's described you know, what we hope are the efficiencies and the utility very well. But I think there may be a political shoe to drop here on the Canadian side that hasn't dropped yet. Okay, did you want a question? I was going to uh, chip in, but I think Teresa and Anne have kind of done a pretty good job. But just, just to underscore the, the point uh, raised about entry exit, I mean, the way it's set up, I'm, I'm sort of one of the negotiators of the agreement. The way we set it up was it's not supposed to I increase any sort of cumbersome features of the border because when you enter the United States, as you do today, you give CDP information and you proceed. And all that's going to happen is they're going to hit a button and that information is going to go to CPSA. So there shouldn't be any noticeable effect of the board. Uh, with respect to exit controls in the air mode, that's something down the road. We haven't thought about it. We need to think about it. There'll be consultations about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. With respect to business travelers, when we consulted with stakeholders, the second biggest issue was business traveler uh, what do I call harassment, <laughs> inconsistent application of laws on Tuesday. I went through to, I said I was going to a conference. I got through in 30 seconds. A week and a half later, uh, they put me in secondary for half an hour. One woman told us she was in uh, secondary, tried to explain the difference between hardware and software to a, a border official because if it was software, she could go through, but if it was hardware, she couldn't. So we've set up consultations led by the minister and the secretary to kind of talk to stakeholders, find out the problem, and to move to a sort of a place where the rules are consistently applied across time and across border points. Uh, and so the whole idea is predictability and certainty for business travel. I, I should just point out that my first trip to Canada as a private sector consultant, I got put into Canadian secretary, uh -huh. and secondary, and asked about what I was doing there, and that was I working in Canada. So, lest anyone think that Canada doesn't also fiercely protect its its labor markets, uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mark. Hi. Um, so I have, a, I guess, the question sort of wasn't really touched on in this panel, but I want to um, reach out a little bit beyond our border and just talk a little bit about the other border, the southern border. And I'm just curious to what extent um, what, what is done in terms of the northern border is informed by things that are being negotiated or done on the southern border. Because I just have a sense that in Congress, we seem to have a sense that, that uh, some congressional people seem to think that the two borders should be treated the same. And I'm just wondering to what extent that is a problem or a, a growing problem and what's, what, you know, are there differences? And just get your perception on, on that. Let me just say politically, we, uh, Canada has reiterated over and over again that we do not want our northern borders treated in the same way as the southern border the U.S. has with Mexico for a whole bunch of reasons, um, and most of them very uh, valid uh, reasons that we all, all uh, know about. Unfortunately, then, sometimes things get said in the U.S., for example, uh, Janet Napolitano's comments sent shockwaves through Canada when she was testifying before a Senate committee and suggested that the U.S. doesn't distinguish between the northern and the southern border. Um, and sometimes I think people don't appreciate how that's received at home, both in officials' places and just with the Canadian public. And that was, uh, you know, the, uh, We've gotten past that. We get past all these things. We pick up the phone, we call, we talk, we realize. And now Janet Napolitano, I don't think, would make that statement. She was reasonably new in her job when that happened. Um, so I think it's uh, from the time at least 9-11, um, uh, John Manley going to Washington, myself with Tom Ridge and Michael Chertoff, we uh, have indicated where, and 
in the SPP, we talk about things, and in other places, we talk about things that we can do all three countries together. And where that makes sense, we should be working together. But the bottom line for Canada is we do see many of the challenges uh, on the southern border not replicated at our border, and therefore, we need to work out mutually beneficial arrangements on the two borders without insulting or marginalizing anyone else. Yeah. If I can just, um, a couple pieces on that. One is, our laws relating to the border do not distinguish which border, right? The laws are, are agnostic about what border it is. They apply at every port of entry no matter where it is. How we carry out that law, if you just look at how the borders are run, is actually different. Um, it, it, it is. I think we tried, in DHS, we tried very much to learn from the best of both sides. Whatever was working on one side, is there, is there a way we can, we can implement that on the other side um, going north and south? Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, uh, because the borders are fundamentally different in how they operate, in, in the types of threats that we're <coughs> looking at. They, similar threats in various levels, right, very different levels. Um, but I would say that we actually do have, the U.S. has a set of agreements with Mexico um, that were instituted in the last few years um, on the border that are uh, akin to this. Um, they, they emphasize a few different things and they work a little bit differently and it has different language because that's the U.S.-Mexico side. Um, but we do have one with Mexico too and, and they're working parallel, if you will. Mm -hmm. Can I just add one real brief thing uh, on this point? Two weeks ago, I went to the Mexican border, um, and I went there for exactly this reason. You know, does it look the same? And all I can tell you is anyone who suggests that the United States treats the Mexican border and the Canadian border the same has not been to the Mexican border. <laughs> that's right. And that's the truth. Um, as Teresa yeah. said, you just go there and you spend 30 seconds looking at what's going on there, and it does not look like what's going on here. You know, the issues of fences at the border in Canada means somebody puts a four-foot-high fence 10 feet away from the, 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 um, the checkpoint so that people don't walk around it. And in Mexico, it's 30-foot razor wire cam. It, it yeah. just does not look the same. And so no one should get the idea that we, while Teresa is absolutely right, we have one set of laws in the United States and we happen to have two borders, uh, that the way that we assess the risks on those two borders and therefore the way that we enforce those laws just does not look anything alike. And at DHS too, we are also uh, approaching it from a corridor point of view. So we have the southern corridor and, and we have the northern corridor. Then while it's in its infancies, it very much tr looks at these things and look differently. The, as Teresa points out, the laws are very much the same. But look at the infrastructure in the northern border versus mm -hmm. the southern border. It's a complete mismatch. The, and then, of course, we have the uh, shared Great Lakes water system, completely different than on, on the southern border. And then finally, um, the amount of trade that crosses the border while still very large on the southern border, does not match what crosses the U.S.-Canadian border on a the daily basis. The reverse is true. There's three times more people crossing the southern so, border legally but, yeah. right. Um, right. Than, than crosses the northern border. So there's a whole different volume of, yeah. of issues that have to go with and And, and uh, like a third of that is pedestrian traffic. You don't have hardly any pedestrian traffic in any northern border crossing. No. So it just yeah. has to be... Yeah. Well, related to that, look, I mean, Mexico is not part of NATO or NORAD or a whole host of legal agreements here that involve security and intelligence that that Canada is has been privy to for yeah. Yeah. 75 or 80 years. Now, Ambassador Negroponte was actually ambassador to Mexico at one point. He may want to talk a little bit about this later. But I just want to say, as a former member of Congress, with the, with the exception of few people along our southern border, who have never been to Canada, uh, no one in Congress really mentally thinks of those two borders as the same. They don't. Um, but there's no reason for anyone to insult or offend Mexico. They no. are a partner right. in a That's lot right. of different Absolutely. things. Absolutely. And they are of growing importance no matter what anybody thinks. Yeah. And they, you know, it's, it's important to us. I just want to underscore one thing that you said, Captain, which I found, uh, I was thrilled to hear which is, you said, with the ballast water inspection yes. in the Great Lakes, the result is there's been no new 
uh, non-indigenous species entering the Great Lakes ecosystem. If we were at a Great Lakes Water Quality Conference, yep. that would be considered one of the most spectacular announcements mm -hmm. of our generation because that is real news for the people here who don't follow Great Lakes water quality. The actual biggest threat to the Great Lakes ecosystem is invasive species. It's even more now than toxic pollution for a lot of reasons. And so hats off to all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Good job. It's a joint We're, venture. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> it's us and the Canadians. But yes, sir. Thank you, Governor. Yeah. We're running very short of time. We had a couple of people who I think wanted to ask questions. No. Jim? Uh, uh, what, I, what I'd ask is, questions are short and the answers are short. Uh, we started five minutes late, so we can run five minutes over. <laughs> I thought I'd just ask, now that it's been over ten and a half years or just about since 9-11, uh, do you all regard it as harder or is it easier in terms of these border issues than it was before 9-11? Harder to work together to solve them? Harder? Uh, to no, address, I mean. I'm just asking because of all of these efforts, yeah. have these efforts in spite of 9-11, is it now easier than it was before 9-11 in terms of getting across the border? Um, oh, okay. well. <laughs> I, I, I think in some ways it's very different. Um, we look at things differently. It was forever marked September 11th in a, in a different framework, framework, but as Anne said at the very beginning, I think this is somewhat evolutionary. And we are we are bound to move in that particular direction because of of the commonality between our two countries, and um, I think that's maybe not a direct answer to your question, but I uh, it is just a different world. I think it, it it is certainly not easier to get across the border, and you will hear from the manufacturers' association and the truckers and everybody on both sides of the border how layered this has become. Um, I think politically you have uh, the risk of complacency, at least on the part of Canadians. It's been ten and a half years, and that goes to my point around the fact that Canadians actually believe and continue to believe that in spite of the horror of 9-11, there has been America continues to be too preoccupied with the protection of the homeland, and that plays out in ways for our border. And um, I, uh, so that I think Canadians, if you're looking at, at implementing something like Beyond the Border, uh, you need political support. Uh, you don't want to alarm Canadians, which is why Prime Minister Harper so carefully communicated and couched what was happening here. Um, so I, I, I really do believe you run the risk as, as events recede in people's uh, memories. Uh, you run the risk that at least in our country people say, why would you do this? There's no necessity for this. This is a huge overreaction. You're just complicating our lives. And Americans sometimes underestimate the political risk that elected officials in Canada run in relation to some of these issues that always end up being sovereignty issues. If I can just really quickly, um, I think that 9-11 for the United States obviously was, was paradigm shifting, um, game changing in a way that we hadn't seen since some days Pearl Harbor. Um, what it showed was that what we had prized as our openness was now a series of vulnerabilities to be exploited. What events since 9-11 have shown, including our famous Christmas Day bomber and uh, the, the printer toner incidents is that people still try, are still trying to find those vulnerabilities. And both of those inc incidents actually prove that it's not just the United States at risk. If, if Abdul Muttalib had succeeded, that flight would have blown up over Windsor. Canada is at risk also. Um, the toners were coming from, you know, the Middle East. And our international system of commerce and transportation and cargo is what's at risk. And we all have an interest in that. Um, and so I think that, you know, is our border easier to come across? No. We are at a new, we're going to be at a new base level. What we need to try to do is find the efficiencies within this new level of security that can enable and facilitate those commerce. As the ambassador said, do what we need to do, but do it a whole lot smarter. 
Um, so in one sense, we were we worked toward the new the new baseline. We got there in a really ham-fisted way in many ways. Now we need to make it streamlined. We need to make it work better. We need to figure out how to how to do that. Chip, we really are running short. Have you got? Can you make a, a very short? Question or comment, and we got a very short. Question. short question. Teresa, you mentioned that you were hauled aside when you were going uh, up to <laughs> Canada, and you mentioned that Canada is very vigilant in protecting its labor market. How much of these security measures are, in effect, protectionist measures, non-tariff barriers, that are used for protectionist reasons rather than security reasons? Yeah. I, I'll be perfectly blunt. Security measures are security measures. They're there because there's a threat uh, or, or a perceived vulnerability. However, regulation, immigration law in both countries is by definition about protecting domestic interests. Uh, that's not unique to the United States. Canada is the same way. It, it, is, it, it is and has always been. It's, it's who do we want to let in who will help our domestic labor markets, our domestic, you know, whatever our national goals are. Um, so for that kind of stuff, absolutely, there's a, there's a reason regulations were put in place. Some of it's about protecting domestic interests, some of it's about safety and security, some of it's about protecting domestic interests in the name of safety and security. That's the same in both countries. Um, it's not more prevalent, in my <coughs> mind, on one side or the other. Um, so I think we do run the risk of, of assuming that a security measure put in place is really all about protectionism. I absolutely would disagree with that. Every security measure has been done because of a, a threat, a known threat, a perceived threat, or a known vulnerability that could be threatened. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's, that's really the truth. I'd like to just wind up this session, first of all, to say that it's great to be at a uh, session where nobody's, nobody has disputed the theory of evolution. That's <laughs> 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 good. And uh, I think we've, we've benefited from the fact that uh, each of our panelists has given us, we've followed the division of labor, as I outlined at the beginning, political, what was called bureaucratic, operational, the different insights, I think each of them in their own area has given us, I think, a much clearer understanding of how this whole process has worked and is working and will have to continue to work. And so on your behalf, I'd just like to thank each of them for, I think, what has been a very productive and enlightening uh, panel session.